they say there are three key factors to a good presentation. A quote, a meme, and uh, some storytelling. I included all of them, so I hope you will find it interesting. And uh, the topic is neurodiversity in the IT and industry, but I think you hopefully already know it since you're here. Uh, I'm here thanks to the support of my company, a software house from Poland, JIT team. Maybe it's not really known abroad, uh, maybe hard to remember, but I found uh, some helpful picture from last year's EuroPython. So in Czech, JIT uh, na piwo, if I'm pronouncing correctly, it's go for a beer. So you can associate this name with a cool uh, trip to get a beer. Um, and uh, I will tell a few words about why do you need do you need to know more about it, more about neurodiversity. You, as an IT professional, as a participant of EuroPython, uh, as a person connected to the IT industry. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, so I'm a test automation engineer working in the QA field. I, actually uh, also in a, a position of a technical PO currently. Uh, but I'm also a human biologist by education, specializing in a biological basis of human behavior. Um, and here I am with the book Psychology for Dummies. Um, and let's start from exploring what diversity is. Just diversity. Um, and I'll give you an Example of my favorite herb, coriander. Uh, I hope you know this herb. Uh, please raise your hands, uh, people who like coriander and who really enjoy eating it. Great. And are there some people who actually hate coriander, like you would never eat it? Great. So this is a really special herb because it really evokes a very, like, ambivalent feelings, so you can either hate it or love it. And there are even Facebook groups, I love, uh, maybe not groups, but uh, pages. I love coriander, I hate coriander, it's really strong. So now imagine uh, we have two types of people and uh, the situation is it's 50-50. Uh, and a world is quite comfortable for both groups probably. So uh, if you have a menu in a restaurant, you usually would have uh, some kind of small signs, right? Like vegan, gluten-free, contains coriander. And then you can just decide if you want to order it or not. And it's really convenient. Uh, if you love coriander, very often you can just say double it. Give me an extra portion. And everyone is happy. But now imagine that the uh, world is Facebook and uh, the group of people who hate coriander is a lot bigger. And let's imagine that only 10% of people like coriander. And actually, out of this 10, only a few know that they actually like it. Because, you know, it's not very popular, so many people haven't even had a chance to try it, to, to taste it. So now maybe 2% is like, okay, I like coriander. And then life is really tough for those two percent. Like, there might be some coriander underground, like, you know, prohibition times, uh, you have some secret clubs, maybe some uh, illegal farms. So then uh, it would be really tough. And the worst thing is that if you say, hey, I like coriander, you are afraid because maybe people will think you are mentally ill, you something is wrong, um, you know, and uh, we fear stigmatization. And maybe you already guess what I'm leading up to. So neurodiversity. Uh, and first let's define what we mean by it. Because there are several definitions of neurodiversity. They can differ. Uh, there's no time to talk about all of them. Uh, if you Google the term, you can read a lot more about it. For the purpose of this presentation, uh, we'll be focusing on one definition. Um, so, there are so-called neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, it's a term, a medical term used in medicine, psychiatry, um, and it means, well, neurodevelopmental, so basically you've got people uh, whose um, 
nervous system and brain has developed in a different way, which is considered medically a disorder. However, uh, nowadays scientists tend to think more and more that maybe it's not a disorder, come on, maybe it's just some kind of natural variety in people, and thus we could regard it as just different neurodevelopmental paths, uh, just different uh, ways in which people's brains and nervous systems are built, which are not better, not worse, just different. And what are these neurodevelopmental disorders? Uh, there are several of them. Uh, for example, it would be autism spectrum disorder, and uh, currently it also uh, includes something that was called Asperger's syndrome. Right now it's just included in the spectrum. Um, there is ADHD or ADD, so attention deficit uh, disorder with hyperactivity or without. And there are others like, for example, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, um, and some others, and many others. Uh, there's no room to talk about everything, and I will be actually focusing on the first two, as uh, I'm competent enough to focus on those two. And we've got two terms, so we've got neurotypical people and neuroatypical people or neurodivergent people. Uh, so we'll be using this definition. Um, Okay, what does it mean that you are on the autism spectrum? It's not that easy. Like, there are basically three groups of symptoms. Um, so these are regular difficulties in social interaction or communication, restricted repetitive behaviors, resistance to changes, interest. And this all sounds really dry. Like, what does it mean, really? And uh, in fact, to be diagnosed, it's really complex. You need to, uh, there need to be some symptoms from all the various groups and they can really differ. So there is no like one pattern. Uh, for example, uh, difficulties in communication don't have to mean that you cannot uh, speak. You can be a great speaker, but in the same time have difficulties reading uh, facial expressions or expressing your feelings. And it's uh, really, uh, it can really manifest in various ways. Uh, with ADHD, it's actually a bit similar. Uh, there is inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, but it can also manifest in many ways. Like there is the stereotype of boys with ADHD who run al uh, around a lot. But did you know that, for example, in girls, uh, it often uh, manifests, for example, by uh, sketching a lot in their notebook and they might seem to be quite quiet people, so you would not really think, okay, it might be ADHD. And uh, it's really complex, it's really quite hard to uh, get a good diagnosis. And I put uh, ASD, ADHD on one slide. Uh, is there any connection? Actually, uh, about 10 years ago, you couldn't even have both diagnoses like in one person and uh, it, it was thought to be like kind of contradicting. But now we know that uh, actually even half of the people of, on autism spectrum are also on ADHD spectrum. Uh, and uh, it's a really, really recent knowledge and it very often uh, overlaps. Uh, and there are also some traits in general common to all neurotypical people. Uh, for example, um, neurotransmitters malfunctions. Your neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters in your brain don't really work uh, well sometimes, so it can cause emotional dysregulation, uh, sensory processing um, uh, sensitivity, and it can lead to specific perception and also specific uh, problems. So there is actually a reason why all neurodivergent people are sometimes kind of like put in one bag, uh, it would seem. Um, and for example, maybe you've seen the neurodiversity bag in this conference. There are many toys in it, uh, like for example, this fish, very cool one, or uh, there are some toys that you can just uh, fidget with. And you will think, okay, what is it? What is it for? 
like uh, these are just toys you can play with as uh, neurodivergent people are often have this need of uh, doing something some like stimulation you know activities just to focus better so instead of tapping your leg or biting your nails which is not good for you you can just play with those and it's a uh, really great um, and please, uh, if you are to remember one slide from this presentation, remember this one. It's about autism spectrum from autism uh, sketches, but it also applies to HDAD, which is thought to be a spectrum as well. So the spectrum is not something like uh, that, like one line, and you can be on that point or this point, uh, like, you know, introverts, extroverts, and just one line. It's much more complicated. It's more uh, like a circle or even a 3D construction. So uh, like various um, uh, symptoms or your threats might be uh, of various, uh, of different, sens um, different intensity and it's really complex. So you cannot really say that, oh, someone doesn't seem to have ADHD or someone doesn't look autistic because there is no pattern really, people can be really, really different. But the best way to explain it is with memes, as I promised you. Uh, so for example, you might be really organized and uh, like to order things, but it's only connected to your special interests. And apart from that, um, well, there is artistic chaos. Uh, sadly, neurodivergent people experience high level of stress, of anxiety, uh, which, which leads to a high risk of some uh, mental illnesses, like for example, depression. And it's due to many factors. It's due to uh, this um, sensory sensitivity. It's also due to not being really adapted to the society. So it's an issue. Well, uh, hyperfixations or hyperfocuses so it's like you have some uh, thing that it really interests you and you will focus on that. And it's really difficult then to focus on other things. Uh, sometimes it's beneficial if your hyperfixation is writing code, for example, as a Python programmer, but sometimes it's a problem. And then, uh, well, uh, when you start this hyperfocus, but then uh, you might just get burned out and you cannot finish it. And while we are talking about burnout, there is some special kind of ADHD or autistic burnout, which is a bit different from classic burnout. Uh, it's more about sensory overload. For example, after such a conference, a neurotypical person might need one or two days to just, uh, you know, uh, gather strengths and like rest. And maybe a neurodivergent person would need uh, one week or something like that. Uh, to do it. Uh, and people uh, who are both on autism and ADHD spectrum might feel like uh, there are two wolves inside of them. Uh, yeah, like some various, you know, like sometimes you feel like an introvert and sometimes you feel like an extreme extrovert and it might be tough. And my favorite one, so me buying some random stuff for my hyperfixation instead of addressing my mental health. And it's also a common case for people with um, ADHD that uh, their impulsivity makes them, uh, you know, go shopping and uh, just become sort of shopaholics maybe. Uh, of course, sometimes it's tough to, you know, make an appointment with a therapist. Instead, you just feel like, okay, I will buy something cool. Um, so what are the problems, some more problems of neurodivergent adults? Uh, well, stereotypes, of course, because many people still believe that autism or ADHD is something that only um, is about children, right? So you can be a child with ADHD, but then you grow out of it, right? Or a uh, stereotype that women actually cannot be neurodivergent. And sadly, uh, these stereotypes really influence you as a neurodivergent adult, if you are one because people might not believe in your diagnosis, for example. Um, and then it's actually hard to get a correct diagnosis. Like, for example, sometimes ADHD might get mistaken for some personality disorder. And you need a really good specialist who can um, distinguish between it. 
So the problem is you might get a wrong diagnosis, uh, some kind of wrong medication, uh, wrong therapy, not adapted to your needs, so that's an issue. And imposter syndrome. Uh, especially if you are diagnosed as an adult, you might be thinking, okay, is this diagnosis uh, really, uh, you know, the right one? Uh, maybe I'm just uh, lazy or maybe I'm just something, this or that, because you believed it your whole life. Maybe, you know, you just doubt yourself and it's really hard to fight uh, this imposter syndrome. But what does it have to do with the IT industry? Several years ago, in the Silicon Valley, uh, scientists noticed something interesting. They noticed that uh, autism diagnoses are, are skyrocketing in the Silicon Valley in family of some scientists, uh, engineers, some people working with STEM. And there is this gig syndrome hypothesis that uh, maybe somehow autistic people are choosing STEM more often as a career path, which maybe would make sense as a, this is some job that lets you a, an opportunity to use your special interests, to have some quite comfortable work conditions. By comfortable, I mean, uh, for example, online communication and other things that autistic people like. And there are even companies that only hire neurodivergent people. For example, some testing companies. And uh, I stumbled across uh, some kind of uh, slogan from one of those that said something like, no matter how bad the situation, our consultants will be always honest with you due to the stereotype that autistic people don't know how to lie. Uh, so it might sound funny, um, but actually, uh, well, do neurodivergent people have some strong sides? And I put a question mark here because uh, there are many of those articles like, oh, neurodivergent, strong sides, superpowers. And actually I found out that many neurodivergent people feel excluded by those slogans because not every autistic person is a savant uh, or super intelligent. And those, these strong sides do not apply to everyone. Uh, so it's like uh, some kind of marketing, which is not always true, of course. However, there are some things that might be considered a strong side. For example, well, special interests. Obviously, if your special interest is in programming, you will become a very good programmer. Uh, if it's, uh, I don't know, languages, you might be able to learn a foreign language really well and use it at work, etc., etc. Hyperfocus, which I talked about already. So, uh, well, if you catch this uh, uh, hyper-focus mode and you are programming or doing something else, it can really be great. You can be very productive and efficient. And some people uh, on the ADHD spectrum uh, like multitasking, which is great if you're working in a help desk or, for example, if there is some fire in production and you need to do something, it might be helpful. Patterns recognition, which might be a strong side of some people and obviously also useful, for example, in programming. Uh, but also details perception. Uh, it's proven that autistic people see things a bit differently, focus more on the details. So they might just see some different aspects of some uh, problems. And all of that contributes to creativity. If you have a diverse team, the team will be just more creative because there will be many types of creativity in many people. However, if we want neurodivergent people to feel comfortable, we need to kind of adapt the office. And uh, for example, uh, let's think about ditching open spaces, which might be really hard to work in. Uh, especially, for example, if you have uh, on one side, you have, I don't know, a kitchen and a lot of smells coming here. Some people are talking, discussing, and you are supposed to focus. It's tough for everyone. If you have some problems with some sensitivity to smell or to noise, it will be even worse. Um, it's good if the space is highly adaptable. So everyone has slightly different needs. Uh, some person might be really sensitive to light and uh, you know those horrible light bulbs sometimes in offices, it's really, horrible. 
uh, but some people might prefer more light. So we should have some options to adapt space to a given person or a given small team. And home office is a really great uh, way to just let people work in an environment they like. And not everyone likes home office, but it's good to give people choice. There are some people who are not even able to commute to work on everyday basis um, because they are so overloaded uh, with all the stimuli in a bus or in a tram. And they might just give up on applying to your company if it's five days in the office. So it's great to consider at least a hybrid approach and give people some kind of a choice and liberty. And work conditions themselves, well, it's already a thing in the IT industry that we have flexible schedule very often and hours, and it's great. We might have some core hours, but uh, we give people options whether they want to sleep in, maybe they are night owls, which is also more common in neurodivergent people, or maybe they have a need to take a longer break and then work in the evening. Uh, and it's really great, especially if you work in hyperfocuses, then you might really get a lot of things done in a short period of time, but then you are completely burnt out. So if there is a manager who micromanages you and looks if uh, you are typing something, you know, throughout seven hours and 40 minutes every day, it won't work for you. It won't make you productive at all. Uh, we should have clear procedures and communication. Obviously, for neurodivergent people, but it's also useful, for example, uh, for international teams. Each culture has slightly different communication patterns. If we don't have some clear procedures, clear communication patterns agreed on, then it might be difficult to cooperate with your friends from other countries. And freedom to use strong sides of every person. Don't look at people like as if you were looking at, I don't know, products uh, in a store on a shelf. Each person is different and it's good uh, if we have managers who understand that and uh, organize the work in a way where everyone can use their strong sides, something they are good at. And actually, I don't know if you've noticed that, but all the things I mentioned can just make work environment great for all. It's not something only for neurodivergent people because we are all different and uh, each of us might need those kind of adaptations. So basically, if you want a uh, work environment to be great for neurodivergent people, you just need to implement some solutions to just make it great for all the people. And that's how it works. Um, so is being a neurodivergent a superpower or a curse? Obviously, this is uh, like a clickbait question because there is no answer. Like uh, it's looking at the things in a shallow way, right? To call it a superpower or to think that all neurodivergent people must be horrible workers. They cannot live in the society. It's also not a good way. Each person is different and a lot, a lot depends on how much support you get from an environment, how much adaptations you get. Uh, so as a neurodivergent, you can have a really successful career. Uh, you can, uh, I don't know, be a businessman, a millionaire like Elon Musk, for example, <laughs> but you can also be a person who really cannot find any suitable job and their place. And uh, I mentioned that, uh, well, I'm uh, in testing industry, I'm a human biologist, but I'm actually also belonging to the neurodivergent community. And I having, I'm having this talk as I want to be an advocate for this cause. I think it's so important to just uh, spread this knowledge and uh, just to make people know more about it. Uh, to get rid of the stereotypes and that will make our life better. Uh, that's it. You can find me under this uh, in page and thank you. <laughs>
So now there will be some Q&A sections for five minutes. So if somebody have any doubts, please go to the mic and you can ask some questions. Also a note, you can ask questions now. If you don't want to do it in public, you can also write me later on. Later on, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. So um, what kind of recommendations or what kind of things have you seen that uh, work better or, or perhaps which ones doesn't? Uh, when you want to communicate that you are neurodiverse to your employer, to your uh, leaders, to your managers, etc. Uh, it's a difficult question, hard to answer that. I think it depends on the employer. And uh, there are many people who don't want to communicate that. Uh, but there are also some cases where you have some uh, special like diversity programs to hire neurodivergent people and you just inform, hey, I'm neurodivergent, and you go through some special process. So it depends on the company, and actually it might depend on the country even. Like we are from various countries, and in some countries there is like, you know, more of this uh, knowledge already being spread, people talking about it. There are some countries where there are still a lot of stereotypes, and if you go to some really small, not an international company, you might fear that they will kind of stigmatize you. So I think it really depends. And uh, I think it's a personal decision. Also, you need to think why you want to talk to your employer. Maybe you think that you are a person that needs a lot of support uh, connected to like, for, like your, uh, the fact of being neurodivergent. Then maybe it's useful to communicate. But maybe you feel like you don't need to share it. It doesn't. It won't make any difference to you. So it's a personal decision, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. It's a very important topic to talk about. So uh, I recently r read a publication uh, where psychologists uh, discuss that they there is a big problem with diagnosing autism. Uh, in part because uh, they don't actually know which uh, symptoms are due to autism and which symptoms are due to trauma caused by growing, out, uh, uh, growing uh, up as an autistic person. Do you think uh, that uh, you know, if, if we improve the environment for neurodiverse people, then we will have to actually modify the diagnosis criteria because uh, we will no longer have all of those. Uh, so you mean that w there will be no longer be people with trauma because they have better conditions, right? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, surely if the uh, environment is better for people, maybe there will be less people with some kind of traumatic experience and it will be maybe easier to diagnose them. But it sounds a bit yeah, like a utopia, right? Like I think uh, we can never get rid of any risk of trauma. But it's also like, uh, it's quite complex, but there are specialists who just select some special uh, types of diagnostic tools to distinguish between like, you know, trauma and other things. Uh, I, I'm not competent enough to talk about it in details, but uh, yeah, we also need a really qualified specialist uh, for that. Hi, thanks for your time. Uh, I want to ask you about to say if it's okay your experience with not your manager, with your team, setting your diagnostic, if you say with it, of putting your boundaries to your team, or if you, maybe you prefer that is your manager who, uh, I don't know, um, manages the situation for uh, being more uh, easy to you, be part of the team. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question. Yeah, because when we work with a team of people, sometimes, these people don't know about us, about our necessities. And I want to know if you share with your team the, your necessities, your boundaries, or you prefer that your manager manage this part, or how to, you to approach to your team to be more integrated but also respected. Okay, uh, so your question is if whether this should be manager who like kind of like helps the person or also the team, right? Well, I prefer know your mm -hmm. experience, your personal experience. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, about this situation because a lot of times we go to our manager and we 
a child or manner or condition. But I think it's important that the team also, well, knows or at least knows our boundaries, but it's super difficult to approach to the team. Mm -hmm. So okay. if it's okay. Yeah, so like from my experience, I actually haven't been needing a lot of special support and uh, Mostly what I do is rather trying to introduce some, uh, for example, clear communication ways to my team or my company. But it's like more uh, that I'm introducing some modifications. But of course, it's uh, very different for each person. So it can work in many different ways. Thank you. Uh, sorry, the time is almost up. But again, like we can meet the person outside and you know, can have the interactions. So there'll be a five minute break and the next section will start. <laughs> 